Hello, and welcome to TidyX, a screencast where we try to explain code to make it much more approachable. My name is Ellis Hughes. I'm a statistical programmer at Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. And my name is Patrick Ward, and I do data analysis in sport. And if you have any questions about uh, this TidyX screencast or the previous ones or something that you'd like to get explained, uh, feel free to hit us up at tidy.explained at gmail.com. All right. So this week we're going to be going through more Tidy Tuesday data. Uh, Tidy Tuesday is a project to get people to be more comfortable in R and have them practice their R skills. So this week's data set comes from Animal Crossing. A lot of people seemed really excited about doing this, at least on Twitter. I don't know if you saw that too, Patrick. It's a, uh, this seems like um, if you were going to buy stock in a video game during quarantine time, it, it would appear that Animal Crossing stock is the way to go. <laughs> yeah, pe <laughs> people like are all about it right about. now. I yeah, see it all like, over the place. People are talking about like, turnip prices and stuff. I, I don't get it. I, I don't, I'm not much of a video gamer myself. No uh, <laughs> so, but a lot of people really seem to like it and we're really excited uh, to have the data. There are a lot of great submissions this, this week. Um, I saw a lot of you know, great visits where they were like, combining multiple plots. Some were base R, some were using ggplot. There was a lot of like, different types of visualizations, a lot of images like using ggimage mm -hmm. to generate these plots uh, because yeah, this data set was actually really rich. It had a lot of URLs that you could pull in images with. Um, but one that we thought was different and really unique, uh, and one that we wanted to explore more was from Ted Ladaris. Uh, Ted works, uh, I think he's down in Portland at OHSU. Um, but he created this table and it, it looks rather simple, but tables are a really powerful way to share information where images, it's more of an abstraction where you're looking for trends and patterns. A table will allow you to actually put like it's text. So you can put the actual value in here, but then there's this uh, new package that our studio came out with called GT, where um, it allows you to add image URLs and whatnot to it. So it adds an additional element to it, which I think is pretty powerful and valuable. Um, so we wanted to explain this and go into this a little bit more about tables. Yeah, um, I think it's really good too, because um, you know, I mean, we, we've done a lot of graphics and things like that, but. I remember kind of like my first job and everyone talks about how you got to have graphics and a nice dashboard and uh, what you quickly realize is there's a lot of decision makers that don't really like interacting with graphics like they're like just give me a straight up table so I can see the numbers myself kind of thing so um, different people interact with different things so I think exploring uh, the ways we can use tables for data is uh, just as valuable as exploring the ways that we can create visualizations. Exactly. So first, uh, Ted posted this screenshot of the code that he used to generate this plot, but I reached out to him, and Ted is amazing. And last night, posted his code and some additional stuff that he worked on, too. So his code is really easy to read. Um, he, he adds a lot of descriptors and uses Tidyverse to make it pretty clear. So he posted the code online. We'll put a link in the description so you can go and look at it more. Um, but we copied his code and brought it into our studio instance here. So we're gonna go through. He has some additional stuff that he explored that we're not going to cover, like I said, because um, we're focusing on the table that he created. So I guess let's get started. So first things first, it looks, he is using an R Markdown uh, format here, which as we've talked about in the past is a great way to organize everything and, and mix in your text with all your code. Um, this first chunk here, he's loading in the libraries. Um, He's using tidyverse per usual. Then there's this library DT that's used for making pretty tables. Um, it stands for data table and it uses JavaScript library and then GG image. And that'll, I think that's used uh, for some of his plots later on. So let's load that, run it. All right, so then, then the next step is he's, he's loading in the data. He's got all the, all the long slugs there. Uh, you could use um, tidy Tuesday R. I think that tidy, this week tidy Tuesday R had some issues. I'm uh, working with uh, um, Thomas Mock to try to resolve some of that stuff. All right, so the the beauty of R Markdown isn't the fact that isn't only the fact that it allows you to organize your code into chunks and then have some pros there. You can actually in in the R Studio IDE collapse the the chunks because they can be they can be relatively long there and you don't necessarily care about that. So you can collapse it because we're not going to be looking at this this chunk here, we're interested in, in this next step. 
So you can just close it down, and you don't have to you don't have to worry about scrolling past it. Um, I don't know. That's just it's just a nice feature that I like to do. If I have a long code chunk, to just collapse that. Um, all right. So this this next step here he uses this package skim r, which is from R Open Sci. Uh, I, I believe it came out of one of their uh, unconf conferences, where uh, skim r allows you to run this function called skim. I believe that's like the power function uh, of skim r, and it creates this really you know detailed summary of everything that's going on inside inside the table here. So it's got some quick descriptors of what the columns are, the number of rows. Um, then it goes into the different types of variables. So it's got a if it's got a character uh, field, then it kind of explains what's going on with that. So here's the column names. Here's mm -hmm. the items there. Uh, what I think is also pretty darn cool too is this, this piece here, where if it's numeric, they add this histogram chunk there. I don't know. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, um, so next, he uh, he's already loaded in Tidyverse. So I'm not quite sure he's doing that again. He just does a quick visualization uh, of the items by category and what you can buy it at. Um, he uses this package GM box plot to draw box plots, um, which draws a box between the the first and third quantile. So fifty percent. The, the middle 50% of the items are captured within the box plot with a mean drawn uh, in the middle of that. He's setting the YLIM because he doesn't want it to go above 75,000 uh, and then themes it. So he does that. Okay, so that's just a quick, I think he's just kind of trying to get an idea of what the data looks like. He clearly didn't do much to it. Um, so now we're going to talk about the actual bit that we thought we, that we wanted to explore today and that is gt in the tables so it looks like he knew that he was going to be using or creating a number of tables so rather than creating a table for each individual um, category what he did was he wrote a function and he called it most expensive and set the argument name to be uh category or set an argument to be category name so that way he could reuse it for multiple categories without having to copy and paste this all this code there not that it's a ton but um so he doesn't have to copy all that text there and uh, generate a table so he does some some error checking there to make sure that the category name that you're trying to pass is an actual category in items so he checks if it's not null so by default it'll be null so you can't accidentally run this um then it makes sure or oh yeah Oh yes, he isn't doing error checking. What he's doing is he's just passing. If it's not yeah, null, if it's not null, you get something back. Yeah, yeah. I got ahead of myself. Um, and then filter it is to create this. He's renaming his items, but it doesn't export to the the global environment. So this is just within this function here that items gets renamed. Mm -hmm. um, then he selects the top n, so the top ten uh, items by sale value, and arranges them by the sale value, and subsets to only keep. Uh, the name of the item, what it sells at, what it, what you can buy it at, the category of that item, and then the URL of that image, because each of the items has an image attached to it. Then he sends it into the, the GT function, which will convert it into the, the GT table, where then you can apply some additional transformations to it. Here it looks like what he's doing is he's... Um, interesting. So it looks like what he's doing is he is trying to create, he's creating, he's creating a transformation. So he's taking image and turning it into um, a web image so that it'll recognize it as HTML. That's what's going on there. Um, so here he's defining the locations. So for each column, so cells body. So out of the, the table there, use image and then use this function web image set the URL to be the, uh, the URL argument to be the URL of the image and set the height to be 50. So by setting the height to be 50, that means all images will be the same height. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise they could, you know, scale randomly and, you know, that's not ideal. So he, he set up this, this whole uh, function there so it can perform that entire task. And then he runs it on hats. So he's looking yep. at, oh, did I not? Yep. Yeah, uh, I guess I didn't, GT loaded. Yeah, I didn't load it. All right, so let's run that. And there you go. 
And hey. that is a super quick way that he was able to create um, a way to look at you know the top 10 items or so with their the name, what it sells at, what you can buy it at. So wow, there's a, there's a lot of depreciation <laughs> there. Um, the category and then the actual image itself rather than a URL or something like that. So that's a pretty nice feature there. Um, but because the way that he wrote it, he, he can look at you know all the, the across all the categories. Uh, he's able to apply it to furniture. Um, and you can see, hey, the golden toilet. Yeah. Wow, look at that. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's expensive. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think that's a great, this is a great tool. I'm really excited to explore GT more, you know, in my professional, um, life, uh, cause we create a lot of tables, uh, yeah. in reports and whatnot. So thank you, Ted, for sharing your code and allowing us to explain it. Um, I think this is a valuable tool that should never, shouldn't be dis disregarded. We should, and we'll, we'll work on exploring it more with y'all. Yeah, and thanks for the introduction to GT. I had never used that at, uh, either. So that's yeah. not one, that's not a package that I was familiar with. So I got to check that out a bit too. All right. Like. All right, so now we're gonna discuss how you can use tables. Uh, this will be a quick introduction to how you can use tables for other content as well. All right, so I'm, let me just quickly restart my R session, you know, clear out everything just so that we don't have any uh, crossings between the two there. No animal crossings. Ha ha ha. I know I'm not paid for it to be funny. All right. So we also took in our markdown approach to this. Um, so first we're going to load in tidyverse. And then as we've done the last several weeks, uh, our best and our best is for scraping web data. All right. So Patrick, you maybe want to take us through this? Yeah, so uh, we pulled some kickers data from NFL.com from the prior season. So that's the 2019 season. So um, uh, rather than doing this kind of in individual steps like we have in the past, I just went ahead and piped it all together since we've done this stuff before. Um, so there's probably no need to really dwell on it. Uh, we read the HTML file. You can see right there where it says season equals 2019 inside of the URL. Um, if you wanted to run some sort of loop and say get everything from you know, whatever 2000 to 2019 or whatever, you could um, you could easily do that by changing the uh, the season there 2019 and then also the season type. We have reg, so this is obviously regular season data, but um, you could change it to other things if you were interested. Preseason. Uh, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, preseason. Pre exactly. I don't. Uh, I wonder if they even have data for preseason. I don't know. I, I, yeah. Um, so uh, we read the HTML file, we tell uh, R that we want the table off that page, we pull the table using the pluck um, function there from the per package, and then we take a look at the head of the table. And uh, we can see that the table, um, it comes in a little bit tricky. If you were to go to the web page and look at the table, you'd see that there was uh, uh, there's, there's two lines for the header, basically, um, because you can see field goal overall, field goal overall, field goal overall. Um, the two lines are basically one that's identifying the distance range that NFL.com has pre-specified. And then below that, in the second line, is um, information about what that player did in that range. So attempts made and then the uh, percentage. So it comes out a little tricky. So uh, there was a bunch of data cleaning that had to take place. Um, uh, we did this in two different ways. Um, uh, Ellis did it using uh, a, a tidyverse approach. I did it using the um, more like a base R type of approach uh, to clean things up. Uh, neither one is, is right or wrong. They're both you know, yeah. totally There's just different ways to really. approach it. It's whatever you're most comfortable with. Yeah, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, so we go through some of the cleaning here. Obviously, we want to take the first row because um, uh, R didn't see this as two two rows being identified as the header. It thought of that second row as the first row of the data set. So we actually want to get that first row because we want our header to be. So we um, 
yeah, we pull that in and then we make the column names the actual row number. And then we remove that first row because that first row is now repeated as the column names. Um, I then go through and I, I want to get the specific columns that I'm interested in are um, the player, the team, whether he made or uh, how many he made out of his attempts. And that's overall of, across all distances. And then I want to get the specific um, attempts dash made per uh, each of the 10 yard bins. So I just named them there X 1 to 19, X 20 to 29, et cetera, all the way up to 50 plus. So we get those column names. <clears throat> OK, there we go. And there we right. go. So now we have a bit of uh, information there mm -hmm. about the about the uh, kicker's performance in 2019. Yep. Yeah. And then this is just another way to approach it. Um, you know, as, as Patrick said earlier, that first row there was accidentally or not accidentally. It's just the way that it read in that HTML table where the first row contained information that we cared about, too. So where Patrick went through and understood or he knew which columns he wanted to be pulling out. The approach that I did is I wanted to paste the original column names so that because that contained the information about, you know, is it a 40 to 49, 50 plus, 30 to 39. So I just pasted together those two values. And then for cases where there wasn't an existing column name, I used trim WS. So trim WS will remove white spaces on the edges of your string. So on the far left side or far right side of your string, it'll remove those and then reassign it back to column names. And then I remove that first row there. And then uh, I subset to keep the the same columns that he he um, called out, uh, but they had slightly different names when I was going through it. And then I used this um, searcher that or tidy vars selector. I, I forgot what they're exactly called, but uh, I knew if it contained an a a dash n, so attempts dash make, I could keep all of them. Mm. So I I contain I have the same data set that he does, just slightly named differently. So yep. let, me, let me quickly re rerun what his code does so that we don't mess up his next step here. All right. Um, OK, so uh, now that we have the data in that, uh, it, it, the data that we want, uh, we have the issue that the A-M columns for each of the 10-yard bins are one, characters, and two, they're characters because there's that little dash in there. So. Um, I just go ahead in tidyverse and use separate to say I pass it the column of interest uh, and then I pass it the two columns that I want to separate my values into, so attempts and maids, and I separate on the little dash mark there. And uh, I, I remove the original columns. There's no need to keep all equals true because there was no need to keep them there. But um, uh, so I, I go ahead and remove all of those. Yeah, exactly. That's a way to explicitly state that if uh, if you care about yeah about it yep so we run that and that'll get us a um, okay that'll get us a data set that we then need to turn all of those values all of those columns into uh, numeric so right now there you can see their characters there by our little tibble on the screen so I just um, call out those columns and use this little apply function to um, identify those columns specifically. And I apply the, the two there tells me the margin that I'm working over, which is going to be column wise. And I'm changing from a character into a numeric. Yeah. And then you added the as dot character there. To oh, yeah. Yourself. I did that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if they were factors, you'd do that. So usually um, I. I I usually do that just to be safe because I don't think you can go from a factor to a numeric. You have to go from a factor to a character to numeric. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right. And so then oh, that I did a similar approach here, but here I made it long. So I did what I did is I did a gather by once all those uh, columns that had the attempts are made in it. So I made it long. Uh, then I went through and did the same separate that he did, but rather than defining each 20 to 29 because it was long, so each row had player and then attempts, um, 
attempts and made in column, and then each row was a different distance. I separated it out that way, and then did a um, I did the same sort of processing there, but this is just long. So uh, here I can just run that oh, stat line. Oh, because I have <laughs> you overrode it. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, and let's just skip forward. I don't. I don't think it's that useful. I end up with the same same sort of format that that you have. Yep. All right. So then let's get into uh, really so data make, processing. Yeah. So we make some simple adjustments here. So in sports analysis, I mean, really, I guess in any analysis, the reason why you'd make an adjustment is to provide more context. So, for example, if we're looking at kickers in this case, it could be you know basketball players and shooting percentage. Um, not all shots and not all kicks are created equal. And so if all we did was look at the um, the unadjusted overall success rate of a kicker, um, you know, attempts are made versus attempts, um, we might be missing some key context in that you might have a kicker who kicks more from the 40 to 49 range or the 50 plus range, in which case those are lower probability type of kicks. Those have a lower probability of being made. Um, so you want to credit those kickers, let's say, um, who take more of those shots and maybe miss. So a guy who's, you know, three for five from 50 plus is not the same as the guy who's also who's uh, three for five from, let's say, 20 to 29. And so we make this adjustment so that we can kind of try and put all of the kickers on an even playing field. Now, this is a very simple adjustment for the purposes of making this basic table that we're going to make to show the data. You could certainly do different adjustments. Obviously, there's um, issues with binning data like this into, you know, into kind of these discrete bins because you're making this assumption that a kick from 20 yards is exactly the same as a kick from 29 yards. So you might keep these as continuous variables and, and build a model that uh, accounts for each yard increment um, as well as other information, things like weather and dome and and stuff like that might be valuable information. But for the purposes of this, it'll, it'll work just fine for making a simple table. So we'll stick with these little 10 yard bins. Um, and so we create our adjustment by looking at within this season, how many, um, uh, we, we look at the number of kicks made per, um, or sorry, you're already down. Yeah, to, I scrolled uh, forward. That was yeah, my there bad. There yeah, there we go. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so we look at the number of kicks um, performed in each 10-yard bin divided by the total number of kicks taken across all players. So this is aggregated across all players. So these are these will provide the adjustments that we then apply to Let's our individual players. So this is saying like 6% of kicks were made – or no, 6% were attempted. of the po point attempt. Point 0.6. Yeah, yeah. Point, point 0.6. Oh, 0.6. Were or attempted within the the 1 to 19, 19 or 24%, yeah. and then only like 15% were made at fi or attempted at 50 plus. Correct. Right. And so the way we apply this adjustment here is we then look at each individual kicker and we find his field goal success rate at each of the 10 yard bins and then we multiply the adjustment. And so we make a quick little adjustment here for each kicker. Mm -hmm. And that gives us an adjusted uh, field goal percentage by then summing over all of those adjusted ranges. And mm. then we can um, create a cool little table to kind of uh, visualize this in some way. So, um, Yeah, and then here's just a tiny verse approach to doing the exact yeah. same thing where I group by distance there on the same data uh, and then calculate the attempt percentage um, for each distance. I do then a left join to add this data into the original uh, kicker stat line, perform the exact same adjustments, but everything is long in this case still, um, and then calculate the um, adjusted and unadjusted uh, field goal percentage based on that. Does, we end up with the exact same table. Um, yep. It's just two different approaches to it. Yep. So then uh, we give uh, two different approaches here. Like I said, I've never used GT, so I decided to put the data in that format first, and then we'll go through a, a table package that I usually use. 
So, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay. So oh, the sorry. GT, uh, the GT approach, pretty simple. Obviously, we go through. We um, yeah, turn the uh, uh, success rates into actual percentages by multiplying by a hundred. Um, I arranged by in descending order, so we get the top at the top. And then um, just select the columns that we want so the table's not too wide and uh, rename some of the columns so that they look a little nicer mm -hmm. uh, when we visualize it. And so there we go. We have a nice little table. We, you know, if we were to save this out to an R markdown or something like that, uh, it would be in a report with a table. We could include visuals and other um, yeah data information pieces around that. So that that's version one of the table. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, I had never used GT before. The so, next version. Yeah, so we just kept it vanilla with this GT. Uh, yep. and, and there, GT has a ton of formatting options where you could potentially like group these two columns together. So at the top there, it listed field goal percentage, and then these specific columns would only list adjusted and raw. Um, you yeah. can do striping and whatnot. There's a lot to it, um, but we just don't have that context and there's the other packages that we wanted to cover too yeah so the one that i've usually used is con format just because um you know i like it i think a lot of people who read um data tables like it is, is if you've ever used excel you can conditionally format columns which gives them sort of a gradient color which gives context around the numbers and so usually um if you were giving someone a table of data and there's a column of values that you think are particularly important that you want to orient them towards. Um, conditional formatting is a great way to do that. And like I said, the gradient colors then show us the, the relative distance between players in some sort of meaningful way that can kind of stand out to a, uh, uh, a decision maker or, or whoever's reading your report. So I go through the same type of um, mutation there where multiply by 100, all of that stuff. And uh, then we oh, run the. Nope. Um, oh, what's that? I got ahead of myself. I ran it before you could explain it. <laughs> oh, that's all right. And then we run the uh, the con format uh, function. There is is the workhorse, and we just pass it this rule fill gradient. So this is just like if you were in ggplot2 and you wanted to do like scale fill gradient or something like that. Same com uh, same common idea. You pass it the column, and then you tell it what you you want the low to be and what you want the high to be. And uh, this is just, a, actually, if you're working in our studio, what I love is that you have an option of the number of entries you can see, so you can keep it short here. I think it goes, yeah, 1025 or 100. Um, oh, we have the, the... The viewer doesn't allow us to scroll, or they didn't oh, set really? it up. I can't that's scroll. That's so weird. My, mine does. Oh, that's interesting. Interesting. Uh, yeah. In mine, I can. Um, anyway, you could write this out to an HTML. Um, I've, I've done that before. But, yeah, it shows just a cool kind of... Uh, um, Highlighting of the players, conditional formatting there. We could have conditionally formatted other columns, for example, the overall attempts, where, um, you know, for example, Kai Forbath is at the top, but he only had 10 attempts, so he would probably um, ping out as being blue, being lower than the other guys. Actually, I think there's someone at the end of the table who had zero attempts. I don't know. They were yeah. somehow on the, in the list, but yeah, uh, yeah there you go. That but, happens. Uh, anyway, that, that's a simple way to use um, conditional formatting, and then uh, Ellis has a, another way to use the color table package that he wrote. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote this package color table. Um, it's relatively simple at this point. Um, the goal of it was to provide coloring abilities similar to the con format. Um, yeah, the con format package there. But I wanted this to be a little bit more interactive. And so you could actually work with it um, in person. So uh, you can install it using remotes from the GitHub account. I don't have it on CRAN. Um, so we're once again doing the same sort of uh, processing that we were doing before, uh, but this time I have this mutate in here where I'm turning adjusted field goal percentage into a color vector. So a color vector is the, the workhorse for the color table package, and so you can assign it to... So what it does is it adds styling characteristics to a vector without changing the actual type. So and then it works across HTML, Word. You can actually print this into your console. So let's, if we run this, oh, I need to subset. Got ahead of myself. All right, there we go. 
So if you you can print this out into your console there, and as you can see, we're looking only looking at the the top ten right now because that's how Tibbles automatically print it out. It limits the number you can view. But if we set it into a print, 10 is equal to 42, which is the number of rows, we can see the entire table there and it, pr it prints nicely into our console. Yeah. And so I think that's a pretty cool uh, setup to be able to do there. But then you can also use this directly in, in our markdown report where you can output um, your tables You know, using the basic knit or cable. It'll apply that same formatting for you as well. Um, with uh, cable, mm -hmm. and so cool. that that is fun. I mean, there's a lot more to it. You can manually decide. Ah, actually, you know, if there's a player you like specifically, you can then say, oh, I want Dan Bailey to be purple because isn't that Minnesota's one of Minnesota's color there? I don't know why you'd want to do that, but color vector. I mean, you can then clearly apply this to a lot of other vectors too. You don't also you can also specifically choose to color. Uh, a specific record too, if you want, if you want to highlight that inside your table um, or stuff like that. So check out Color Table um, yeah. if that sounds of interest to you. Um, I'm looking for people to you know try it out and give me feedback on what they need. <laughs> it's just been yeah. me playing around with it. Um, awesome. Yeah, and I think that's everything. That's it. Uh, use tables to show your data. It's a good way to do it. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot of fun. And uh, thank you all for listening today. Uh, once again, my name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And my name is Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And you can always hit up the both of us if you have questions on TidyX and things that you've seen at tidy.explained at gmail.com. All right. Thank you. And keep exploring your world.